230 students. We will pick back up in chapter number 9 talking about body mass index or what is commonly referred to as BMI. And body mass index is simply a ratio of height to weight. As a person's weight increases in relationship to his or her height, body mass index will increase. And in just about any type of clinical study that you could ever possibly imagine, height and weight are recorded for each individual subject. And what this does is gives researchers an amazing volume of data when they're looking at chronic disease, in particular cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and cancer. And what we know very clearly from this massive amount of data is that there is a direct relationship. As body mass index increases, risk for cardiovascular disease, diabetes, in particular diabetes type 2, um, and certain types of cancer increases. Now, for a person's body mass index to go up, uh, one of two things has to happen. They either have to gain muscle mass uh, and or bone uh, connective tissue mass, or they have to gain body fat. Now, as you can well imagine, it is much more common for a person to have a high body mass index because he or she is carrying around excess amounts of body fat as opposed to carrying around excess amounts of, say, for example, muscle or bone. And um, so what, what that does is allows us to make some, some pretty good generalizations. When body mass index is high, well, we usually know that a person's body fat percentage is also high. As a person's body fat percentage or BMI increases, one of two things is going to happen. Either the number of fat cells is going to increase or the size of individual fat cells will increase. If a person is increasing the volume of body fat that he or she has during adolescence, then we are going to have a condition called hyperplasia. And that is where, where a person increases the number of fat cells that he or she has, she, he or she has, pardon me. There's another condition where the fat cells simply increase in size. And after, uh, after adolescence, we really very seldom see a dramatic increase in the number of fat cells a person has. Uh, what happens is the fat cells that a person has simply get larger. And uh, admittedly, there are situations where a person becomes obese or su super morbidly obese where the number of fat cells does increase, but that is the exception, not the rule. You see it illustrated here how that process occurs. And very simply, fat cell size increases when energy intake exceeds expenditure. All right, an enzyme that you should know is lipoprotein lipase, and that is a that is an an enzyme that promotes fat storage. Uh, we also have have leptin as well as ghrelin. Uh, leptin is a is an appetite suppressant, and and I'm going to flip flip forward one slide here, but I'll come back. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm going to flip forward too. Um, you can think of ghrelin and leptin uh, kind of kind of in the same um, in the same realm. Um, both are hormones, and leptin uh, it, it's it's going to be released from the cells in the lining of the stomach, and um, that happens when there is a when there's an inadequate amount, well, I shouldn't say inadequate, just simply when there's not food in the stomach. <laughs> uh, the, the fat cells, uh, the, the, I'm sorry, the uh, epithelial cells in the stomach, they, um, they send out this leptin message up to the brain, in particular up to the hypothalamus, saying, hey, we, we don't have any food down here. Um, you should be hungry. You should eat something. On the flip side, ghrelin does just the opposite. When a person's full, then it will suppress appetite. Uh, you can see here the difference between the mice. Um, 
on the one on the left of your screen, it is deficient in leptin. On the right hand side, we have a mouse that is treated with leptin. You'll notice it is dramatically smaller, and um, that, that, that makes good sense. If you expose a mammal to leptin, it will suppress its appetite. All right, let's move on to health problems associated with obesity. Uh, health risks are, are oftentimes evaluated by body mass index. Uh, things that are measured would be waist circumference, body fat percentage, as well as what are called disease profiles. Uh, that first bullet point there is a bit debatable. <laughs> um, so I'm going to skip over it. Obese or overweight people with risk factors can improve health by losing weight or using other diet and exercise strategies. When a person is obese, they are at risk for a multitude of things. Hypertension, high low density lipoproteins, low HDLs or high density lipoproteins. Uh, both of those increase your or increase a person's risk for having a cardiac event. Uh, these people oftentimes have impaired glucose tolerance, joint problems from carrying around excess amounts of weight, sleep apnea because they literally just can't breathe, and finally some li the, the lifestyle issues that go along with being obese. Uh, I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one. This, this is really a topic for psychology class. Uh, there is a full section on perceptions and, and prejudice and I will let you look over that yourself. We're going to talk more about fad diets here in a little while, but I'll tell you now and then, then tell you again that um, fad, fad diets just don't work. Um, you know, there's, there's a flavor of the week, <laughs> it seems like, with fad diets, and they just go from one to another to another to another and reality is that most are not based in science. Uh, I do want you to know what ephedrine is. Um, it, is a, it is a drug uh, that's going to inhibit serotonin and suppress the appetite. Uh, luckily, ephedra has been banned by the FDA due to its potential health risks. However, um, you, you still can get it. Um, it's not that hard on the internet. Um, of course, uh, you can get it in other countries, just have it shipped here. There's always the risk of being caught, but um, it's not overly hard to get. Um, herbal laxatives, that's another um, common uh, misconception that uh, laxatives significantly reduce caloric con uh, absorption. Uh, yes, they do minimally, but um, you're really get not getting a whole lot of bang for your buck, <laughs> and um, you're putting yourself in a position where um, uh, <laughs> where there's going to be some lifestyle issues. Um, this next one I think is important because I, I've been working in this field for for a long time and I've worked with a lot of people who have weight issues and um, there are some procedures in the clinical field now that, um, that, that, that time and time again do have some fairly significant success rates. Um, there's there's multiple different types of bariatric surgery, but um, by far and large, most bariatric surgeries do have a fair amount of success. There are some drugs on the market as well. Uh, in particular, um, Sibutramine. Uh, my my apologies for the um, uh, the pronunciation there. Uh, it's going to suppress the appetite and is most effective when used with a reduced kilocalorie diet and increased physical activity. However, there are a lot of side effects that go along with it. Uh, there's also one that I'm much more familiar with, and that's Orlistat. And um, uh, Orlistat works very well. However, there are major side effects that uh, most people don't like because they're they're just not very pleasant. Now, this is what I 
I want to take a moment and really emphasize because surgery is a good option for certain people. Uh, we're, we're progressively seeing more and more people who have body mass indexes greater than 35. And so long as these people are in fairly good health and they are relatively compliant with doctor's orders, gastric bypass is, is a pretty good option. Um, however, liposuction is not. Uh, you see here illustrated what goes on, although um, that is not necessarily the best illustration. Um, what happens, generally speaking, when uh, when a gastric bypass is occur or is is performed, is that the stomach is dramatically reduced in size, and um, what this illustration is showing is that uh, they're going to cut the stomach here and that makes for a much smaller stomach pouch uh, obviously not a lot of uh, food breakdown occurring there that food goes directly into the small intestine where minimal absorption occurs and or absorption is not as efficient um, however I will mention that <laughs> It's been my observation that usually they leave a little bit more of the stomach. There's also this um, this procedure where they put a gastric band around the stomach, and uh, that's going to limit the amount of food that can go into the stomach at any given time. Helps minimize overeating. Now, these next few slides um, I, I'm going to talk about in very general terms weight loss strategies. I, I've shared with you my general philosophy on weight loss strategies that what you need to be doing is conveying to people that they need to be in a caloric deficit and if, and if they understand um, how many calories are going in as well as how many calories are going out through um, tracking their their dietary intake and then ultimately tracking the number of calories that they burn uh, well it gives you really good perspective as to whether or not you're you're gaining weight or losing weight now there's all these recommendations and sometimes you know, these are good especially for people who cognitively can understand them um, but for those who may have some 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 issues as it relates to understanding the complexities of the physiology of weight gain and weight loss when you can show them two separate numbers calories in calories in and calories out well most people can understand that very simple premise that hey if a is bigger than b then um <laughs> then uh we're, they're going to have additional uh, and maybe I just need to rephrase that when uh, a situation where more calories are coming in than are being expended there's going to be um, calories stored as fat um, one more item that I do want to touch on uh, fad diets it is almost always um, safe to assume that fad diets are a bad idea. Um, the science of weight loss does not change dramatically from one year to the next. Uh, it is what it is. Uh, people need to have uh, need to have a balanced diet getting an adequate amount of vitamins and minerals and amino acids and if they're not getting those then there are health consequences. Um, in, in, additionally, um, what a person needs to do is make sure that they're getting those vitamins and minerals, but reduce calories. And that can largely be done by making good choices, eating foods that are low in energy density, uh, foods that are low in fat as well as low in sugar. All right. Um, Thank you for your attention.